lives a double life. Here's to the fear of being trapped. Risk taker by day. I saw him wreck a hundred thousand dollar boat because he liked to splash. Thrill seeker by night. Just how big of a thief are you? Anything's attainable. Is it more fun getting it than keeping it? Tonight, get a special sneak preview. Catch him if you can. Just go! The Thomas Crown Affair. Rated R. Sneak preview tonight. Dad showed me how to run my business by the book. So before I made an important choice about my personal life, I got all the facts. For 25 years, mentor breast implants have been the preferred choice of women and their doctors. I did my homework, talked to my doctor, and I even found out how to pay for it on my own terms. You know, I really wish I'd done it sooner. It was the right decision for me. Mentor, for a free information kit on breast augmentation, call 1-800-434-0995. Look at the latest ride shot shows scattered thunderstorms across the southern Rockies, more numerous thunderstorms across the middle Atlantic and southeast region. Thunderstorms also in the eastern Great Lakes. For tonight, most of the thunderstorms across the southeast will weaken. It's like a dry night across the upper Midwest. Low temperatures tonight will be quite comfortable across the northern Great Lakes and the northwest, but still warm and sticky over the plains and southeast. on how and why the death of John F. Kennedy Jr. has moved this nation like few others have. We examine America's fascination and grief at the passing of a man and an era. All that and more next on Charles Grodin. I had been uh, going out with the lady that I eventually uh, happily married for about six months uh, many years ago. And... Uh, one day she said to me, there's a story about my father in Variety. The Variety being the show business paper. And I said, why, why would there be a, a story about your father in Variety? <laughs> being the kind of person, I didn't ask uh, somebody that I was going out with, what is your father? I just did, it never came out, I didn't ask. She said, well, my father owns some uh, movie theaters. I said, oh, oh, does he? And I read the story, and at that point I learned that my uh, girlfriend, wife-to-be, uh, his father owned one of the largest uh, theater chains in the world, with theaters all over America and Europe and over 2,000 American multiple cinema. Top of the line, uh, you don't get treated better than when you go to one of these the American MAMC theaters. And, uh, and then I started to learn about this uh, this man, my wife's father, Stan Derwood, and I learned that he actually, uh, many, many years ago, when he was first starting out, his dad had three theaters, and then he built it up from there. And one day he was uh, in one of the theaters, and they were playing a movie, and it was, the theater was fairly empty, the balcony, nobody was sitting up there. He closed the balcony to save the expense of putting an usher up there, and he got the idea all those years ago that, uh, you know, if they could put another movie up there in the balcony somehow, uh, maybe that would be a good idea. Stan Derwood, my father-in-law, invented the uh, multiple theater concept in America. He uh, also invented the idea of the cup holder. So when you go to the theater and you put, there's a place to put your cup, uh, uh, that's uh, Stan Derwood, my father-in-law. And as he told me once, he went to his father when he was first starting out, and he said, what would you think about selling popcorn in the lobby? And his dad, as he told the story to me, said, that is the dumbest idea I ever heard. So Stan Derwood, uh, my father-in-law, who was a dynamic, warm, loving person, uh, died uh, last uh, Wednesday. And... Um, he changed the way the world sees movies. And he did. And then there was a quote I read uh, today uh, in one of the uh, stories that was written about him, and many stories were, the quote from the Associated Press where he said we, about the people that go to the movies, we love you, we really appreciate your business, we want to make your stay pleasant and fun. And that quote 
I like that quote so much because that really captures the spirit of my father-in-law, who was a very warm, loving man who provided work for thousands and thousands of people and personally looked after many, many people. He was uh, very uh, giving toward his community in Kansas City. The mayor spoke at the, uh, at the service, and I, I feel very sad about my father-in-law Stan Derwood's passing very sad and I just was Wednesday night uh, a week ago Wednesday night and uh, Saturday morning I was talking to my sister-in-law Carol and she said uh, it's two days after Stan's passing she said uh, John Kennedy Jr.'s plane has gone down or they can't find it or it's missing and thing of the bent of mind I am I immediately properly uh, thought the worst young people dying is uh, just unspeakable and if we know them there's some very close friends who lost uh, their 14 year old daughter she went away on a skiing trip and they got a phone call that she went into a tree their 14 year old only child died when she hit the tree uh, and in the case of John uh, Kennedy Jr., there is this remarkable outpouring of grief, and uh, we ask ourselves why, and, and there are many reasons, and one of them is I think we, we have so few people left that we like. We have destroyed just about every public figure that comes along these days. We fill with so much hate and venom toward our public. Ralph Nader, who is a personal hero of mine, who is basically trying to save our lives in so many ways. You, you put him on television, so many people say, what's he talking about now? What's he, what else is on? Even when Mother Teresa passed, people were saying, yeah, but she took money from dictators to help her cause. There's so much hate and venom out there. I saw a piece of hate mail before the show. Tonight, this writer hates me. He hates the poor people. He hates the elderly. He hates the disabled. He hates everybody. And I think one of the reasons that we love John F. Kennedy Jr. is that he is the opposite of this. That kind of venom seems to eventually come to every public figure. And it's one of the things that I think is deeply wrong with our country today. So there are many ways to look at this, this tragedy. And we will, and uh, have a panel tonight of uh, the Jerry Spence, the trial attorney, and Sonia Friedman, the psychologist, and Anthony Robbins, the peak performance coach. He has many things. Alan Lickman, the historian, E.J. Dion, the columnist from the Washington Post. Many ways to look at it, many things to talk about it. First, I'd like to hear uh, what Jerry Spence has to say. Uh, my old friend Jerry Spence. And Jerry, I'd just like to ask you, uh, thank you for joining me and w w what are your thoughts about all of this uh, because there's so many things we can say from so many angles and I think probably you have something to say that might be a, a little different than what we normally have been hearing Jerry I think that uh, Charles that we all have to grieve the passing of this man who's the last of a sort of aristocracy in this country the last of of a almost uh, popular monarchy that uh, began with his father and um, and then his uncle Bobby uh, and that they've become martyrs and they have become important people to us and so the son of this important man his father who dies permits us to grieve all over again for the father but you know there's another side as you suggest Charles and that is that if we cry for the death of John Kennedy Jr. it doesn't require us to shed so many tears for the hundreds of thousands of workmen that die every year from uh, in negligent workplaces it doesn't require us to worry about the uh, hundreds and millions 300,000 children that are addicted uh, every every day to tobacco doesn't doesn't stop us from uh, do, we don't have to worry about the homeless we don't have to worry about the injustices of this country because we are crying for John F Kennedy 
Jr. We have focused on somebody who isn't, we've never met, we've never touched, and by focusing there, we don't have to look around us to the injustices, to the, to the, to the uh, losses that each American suffers every day in one form or another, the grief that we all have, it's so much easier and so much cleaner to have our grief over an icon. You, you know, Jerry, uh, I, I thought about that as well. And, uh, well, I, I, as you do, grieve for this young man and these two young women. Uh, we don't seem to put the focus on this. If you do, if you want to talk about the homeless or the poor or the disabled or the elderly in this country, people switch the channel. They are not interested. It is much easier, as you say, to a romantic figure, an icon, and somebody we can invest with all the attributes we want to invest, and it does take it away. Why do you think it's so difficult for us to look at the real hurting people who are dying every day in this country? Why is it? Is it because we know John F. Kennedy Jr. is because he comes from a martyr? Is it, is, it, it just, is it easier? Is it too much work to go the other way? Well, first of all, I think we need to recognize that it's awfully hard to see our own beauty. It's hard to see the beauty of ordinary people. And we have been taught, uh, Charles, that ordinary people aren't really beautiful. They're just numbers in the corporate uh, financial sheet. They are uh, uncounted soldiers that die. They are people in Kosovo who are bombed, who are nameless. They are 10,000 in graves who don't amount to anything. They are just foreigners. Um, we have been uh, taught that we mustn't worry about these people and somehow if we can focus on John F. Kennedy we don't have to see the importance of every human being in this country and in this world and to see the beauty of these people and if we can love John F. Kennedy we don't have to love ourselves we don't have to love our neighbors we don't have to love the black people in the ghettos. We don't have to love the poor. We can love John F. Kennedy and having loved him, we don't have to love anybody else, including ourselves. Let's, uh, I want to uh, show a package. Thank you, Jerry, for that. Uh, uh, I want to show a package prepared that's narrated by Kelly O'Donnell about the morning and Jerry will stay with me for the rest of the show, and we'll be joined by our other guests. But let's, let's take a look at the, uh, pack, the NBC package about the morning of uh, JFK Jr., please. Flowers wrapped by his photo. Candles left on a curb. Handwritten messages. Makeshift homemade symbols, now a ritual of public grief. A kind of memorial somehow both spontaneous and yet expected. I want to share my sorrow with the family and with myself. I needed to do it. What is behind that need? Why do so many reveal their personal feelings of loss with such public expressions of sorrow? I'm here today because the Kennedy um, is a part of my life. I didn't know them, but I felt like I could. Professor Gary Laterman studies America's response to death. And these kinds of national tragedies do force us into a moment of sort of common reflection. And collective experience. Outside John and Carolyn Kennedy's New York City apartment, 10,000 people wait hours just to pass by the couple's front door. The JFK Presidential Library in Massachusetts, draped in flowers. The old, the young. A new generation who now remember where they were. And inside, a two-hour wait to sign a condolence book. 300 pages already filled. Six extra books brought out to meet the demand. I, I like the fact that we can come here and pay our respects without bothering the family. I think this is, um, I feel very close to them here. That desire to feel close has become a cultural reflex at moments of national sadness. The death of John Lennon filled a New York street with candlelight. The bombing site of the Oklahoma City Federal Building, offensive teddy bears and flowers. The parking lot at Columbine High, a field of mementos and words of comfort. These gatherings, a way to confront the unanswerable, inevitable question, why? In this 
technological age when we think we really have um, the capacity to master the universe and it really forces us to be be thoughtful about death in ways that again I don't think we um, are very often Kelly O'Donnell NBC News New York Jerry Spence says if we can love John F Kennedy jr. We don't have to love ourselves. It's a provocative statement. I want to go to a break right now, and we'll be... Jerry will... More tragedy for one family, a painful reality for another. How are the besets remembering Carolyn and Lauren? On the news tonight at 9 on MSNBC. This summer. Put to Bill Conquo's 300 horses to the test and get the response you're looking for. Then, put this opportunity to the test. Take advantage of up to $5,000 in factory to dealer cash. You'll even get a three-year Smart Care Basic Maintenance contract at no extra charge. So drive a Concord today and put Cadillac to the test. When you buy a bargain basement PC, what you're really buying is a mystery box. Will there be a monitor? Probably not. Lots of software? Ha! Ah, a year on the internet? 24-7 tech support? Dream on. With a Gateway Essential PC, you know exactly what you're getting. Monitor, great software, award-winning tech support, and internet access for $28 a month or less than a dollar a day. No mystery there. Call 1-800-GATEWAY for a Gateway Essential PC with an Intel Celeron processor. I believe in taking the time to be right, because it's a lot faster, because it's a lot faster than, being than being wrong. I believe in taking my clients seriously, and myself less and myself. so. I believe integrity doesn't hinder performance. It is performance. It is performance. I believe we are driven to succeed, because we are unwilling to fail. I work for J.P. Morgan. Trabajo en J.P. Morgan. The work for J.P. Morgan. Brandon, promise to do my best to help other people, friendly and kind. I had the smile. Promise to do my best to do my duty, helping out. Help the elderly, tooth long, plant a tree, that kind of stuff. Promise to die in my country, to help other people, doing good deeds for other people, taking care of your environment. It's fun to obey a lot of that. Scouting, because it's so much to live up to. It's a cool thing to do. It was called the greatest generation any society has ever produced. They were ordinary people who half a century ago did nothing less than help save the world. Millions served in uniform, millions more served at home, and nearly half a million gave their lives. And yet there is no national memorial to honor their sacrifice. It is time to say thank you. Call now and help build the National World War II Memorial. I was a little kid when his dad died, and I thought innocence was lost, and uh, this guy gave me hope. You know, he's, he's, um, he was a good example to a lot of people, and he lived in a multimedia circus, and he was so graceful. Um, we need more people like him who, I don't know, who just stand up for what they believe in, and there's such good examples for people today. We were all dreaming that one day he'll become president, and this is the last. Um, it's the gift that his mother, Jackie, and his father, John, gave us is gone. It was a gift to our country. Sonia Friedman, the psychologist, joins Jerry Spence. I mean, Sonia, uh, Jerry said something very provocative at the, uh, the, uh, before the break. If we can love uh, John Kennedy Jr., we don't have to love ourselves. Do you identify with that? Do you want to comment on that observation? I think Jerry was very eloquent. I might substitute the word look instead of love. We don't have to look at ourselves. The tape that you played, the package from NBC, talks about the hope that people had of John Kennedy Jr. in some ways helping them, rescuing them, making a personal contribution to their lives. They can make a personal contribution to their lives. And instead of the flowers and the crying and along with the mourning, why not keep George Magazine alive? If you really feel so deeply about this man, then allow the beacon of light that he brought to this country, which represents him, to do well financially and editorially. That magazine may be in trouble. If you believe in it, get a subscription. Get a corporation to buy ads. Make sure that it stays alive 
and is the eternal flame to John Kennedy Jr. To me, we live our lives in fantasy this entire week, in addition to the fact that it is a great human tragedy for a family and for a country that really lives with the myth that it ascribes to others. He would have been president, he would have been senator. We don't know what he would or would not have done. Charles Grodin, my husband, has been married to me for over 30 years, and you want to know the truth? He doesn't know everything about me, nor do we really know the real inner John. Maybe Caroline does, if they were specially bonded. But the rest of us live in a fantasy of wanting others to do something very special because we refuse to do it for ourselves. And that's the tragedy that I hear as people feel that somehow their dreams have been shut off because they will close themselves out from activating their lives, from their will for that spark of life to make things happen for themselves. The other thing I find fascinating, and I was so pleased to hear Jerry Spence call him a man. It is the first time on television that I have heard John Kennedy Jr. refer to as anything but a young man. Do you know that in this country, adolescence only came into being in about the 1950s? Before that, we were children or adults. And the generation before me became adults at 17, 18, going into war, getting married, having children. Caroline Kennedy, at 41, has three children, the oldest of them 12. At 38, John Kennedy Jr. could conceivably have been a grandfather. But we hold on to the mythology of this boy because we see him as our son, a family, and in some way belittle, I think, the position in life that he had, and frankly, that he may, I, again, one doesn't know, but may have been trying to elude the John John factor. You know, he will be frozen forever in time in this particular way, and we can conjecture anything that may have been, but the deep loss is frankly less to us than to the immediate family, and somehow we trivialize grief when we talk about loving John Kennedy Jr. It is the kind of romanticizing that gets men and women in trouble all the time. We could look to him for inspiration, and certainly those of his generation, I'm sure, have done that. He was a decent fellow. And one thing that I saw on the air that amazed me, Mike Barnacle was on the air, someone whose columns I have loved through the years, trying very hard to protect John Kennedy Jr. from having any responsibility in this great tragedy. Now, none of us may ever know truly what occurred. But he was the captain of the ship and he made the decision to go. And all that I hear from his friends is about how decent and responsible he was. Why would we even want to deprive him of responsibility if indeed it was his responsibility? That's a part of the maturity of this nation, is yeah. for all of us to stand up and to That's take right. some responsibility. Well, I think, I think she's right, uh, Charles, and, and it's hard to say what she just said. It's hard to say that in face of, of the American throng that loves John Kennedy and, and really love the mythology of John Kennedy. What we lack so much in this country, as you said in your opening, is our heroes. We need heroes, and unfortunately, heroes don't seem to exist until they die. John Kennedy Sr. wasn't much of a hero until he was assassinated, as was Martin Luther King, as was Jesus Christ, and now with the crash of John Kennedy Jr.'s airplane into the ocean, he becomes another American hero. We but need John, live yeah, heroes. I mean, Jerry, you know that we tend to make people larger in death than they ever are in life, and one of my favorite pictures of John and Carolyn Kennedy is them fighting in Central Park. And you know why I love that? Because it humanized them. Because it was real. Because whoever it is, Jacqueline Kennedy fought with Jack and Carolyn fought with John Jr. And this is a part of us that's human. And when you say that, I feel sad because in you, in me, in every one of us, there is a piece of the hero. We push that person back because we want to be rescued. But for heaven's sakes, we must rescue ourselves. Exactly. There's no one out there. Exactly. And you know, I, it goes back to the same thing. I'm thinking of the impeachment processes in which uh, Charles uh, Grodin raged and, uh, and I raged and uh, many others did that we were all involved in this whole process of the impeachment of this, of this president.
I'm so sorry. The country was going to hell. I'm sorry, Jay. I'll, right, country... I'll, I'll be right back with Mike. We'll look at what's going on behind the scenes here on Capitol Hill. 